Hello, Creator Family. Welcome to Neo the Greatest Masterclass. It's been a minute without a masterclass, and I know you guys are hungry for truth, hungry for knowledge, hungry for the secrets of success from the Bible. And today we'll be looking at some interesting, powerful concepts regarding how you can mount up like the ego. In fact, that's our topic today. How to mount, mount up like the ego. Now, before we jump into the topic, I just want to thank you for being part of this movement, a movement connecting creators, a movement inspiring other creators to create like God does. If it's your first time on this channel, I'd like to invite you to join the family by subscribing and clicking on the notification bell. That way, when I launch a new masterclass, you'll be the first one to know. And so let's jump right into the video. We have a picture of an eagle and it's soaring, right? Soaring like a, like an eagle. Powerful picture. In fact, uh, the eagle is so interesting because it's referred to as the king of the birds. And that speaks to its and that's just because of its tremendous uh, power, prowess, you could say, when it comes to flight. So the ego is known for flight. So ego, let's reduce the, come on up, maybe that's better. Yes. So ego, so the ego is known for flight. Now, flight is an interesting phenomenon because we live in a world, in a space, we exist in a space and a world that has something called gravity. Gravity. So essentially flight is the opposite of gravity. These two cannot coexist. Like one is the antithesis of the other. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because uh, a while back I did a video on Newton's laws of motion and how they apply to life. And one of the laws that Newton expounded on was law number three, uh, which says that actually this is law number one, that an object will remain inertia and inertia is real. What is inertia? Inertia is the tendency of objects, subjects, or whatever the case may be to remain in the same place, to remain as they are. It's the tendency of things to remain as they are or to remain where they are. And inertia in a more scientific term will be, the law in a more scientific term is stated in, and the law in a more scientific format is stated to say that an object at rest sh will remain at rest, or an object in motion will continue in, in uniform motion unless acted upon by an external force. In other words, things remain the way they are. And so gravity Gravity shows us that we are on earth. Gravity is pulling us down. That's the explanation to inertia. And for us to take flight, to fly, we have to break away from the gravity. And that's really what we're going to be discussing today. How to break free from gravity. This video is for those of us who are tired. Those who are sick and tired of being sick and tired. Those who really want to break free. Yes, everybody has inertia, but for some of us, the inertia is keeping us down. The inertia is keeping us bounded and enslaved, so to speak. And we want to break free from the inertia. But there's a secret for you to break free from that tendency of being the same person you've been for the last year, for the last two years. Why is it that you can't just be different? Why is it that you can't just attain to the success you're looking for? Why are you still bound by the past and by, by past mistakes and by, by past traumas and all that? Today we'll be looking at how to break free from all that, how to break free from your past, how to break free from your trauma, how to break free from everything that's keeping you down in that inertia state. And so without much further ado, let's jump straight into it. All right, here we go. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 31 is the key that we're going to use to unlock the power that God has for us today. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagles. They shall run and now be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 
what does this verse have to do with inertia and breaking free from inertia and taking flight and soaring? The interesting thing about this verse is the word ego. Of course you will know that. I told you the title of this video from the beginning of the video. What I love about God is how he uses uh, nature and the things he has created to teach us powerful lessons that we could never have learned otherwise. Because when God created us, remember he spent six days creating things for us really before he created us. Meaning that everything that God made before in the six days was created for our service, to serve us. Everything that God created in the six days was created to serve man, to save, to serve you and me. The eagle is an interesting animal. It's really the king of the birds because of its phenomenal ability to fly. But how does it fly? And what does God mean to say that if we wait on him, we shall mount up like eagles and we shall not be weary? How is that possible? And how does that look like? Because from this verse, the promise is if we wait on the Lord, we shall renew our strength. And then he gives us an example like the eagle. So in what way does the eagle wait? And in what way does the ego fly and is not weary? In what way does it run and walk and does not faint? And that's what we're going to break down in the next few minutes. Number one, the ego. The ego is an interesting creature. We could look at a quick summary of the ego here. This is from Wikipedia. Thank you, Wikipedia. And it says that egos are large powerfully built birds of prey with heavy heads and beaks. Even the smallest eagles, such as the booted eagle, which is comparable in size to a common boozard or red-tailed hawk. They have relatively longer and more evenly broad wings and more direct, faster flight. That's the key, faster flight. How do they have faster flight? And how can we achieve faster flight like the eagles? Despite the reduced size of aerodynamic feathers, most eagles are larger than any other raptors apart from some vultures. The smallest species of eagle is the South Nicobar serpent eagle at 450 grams and 40 centimeters. The largest species are discussed below. Okay, so let's consider some powerful facts about the ego before we actually dive into the dynamics of our topic. So first of all, we realize that egos are large, they are powerful, and they have heavy heads and beaks. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it says that even the smallest egos are really comparatively bigger in size. Now, the other part that's interesting is to realize is that the beak is typically heavier than most of other birds of prey. But what's powerful about the eagle, and the first highlight I want us to talk about the eagle is its eyes. It says here that eagle's eyes are extremely powerful. So the first thing we are going to learn about the eagle is going to be vision. It says here that it is estimated that a wedge-tailed eagle has a visual acuity twice that of any typical human. So the eagle has more visual accuracy, so to speak, or visual acuity, acuity, which really means the sharpness or visual sharpness. Eagles have a visual acuity, the ability to see from afar or visual sharpness or focus, twice that of any typical human. And then it continues to say that this acuity enables eagles to spot potentially prey from a very long distance. So the power of vision, we'll talk about that. And this keen eyesight is primarily attributed to the extremely large pupils. Now it goes back to why they have a large head at the beginning to keep in, in place those large pupils, which ensure minimal diffraction or scattering of incoming light. The female species are so this the female of all known species of eagles is larger than the male. Okay. Now, what other interesting facts do we have here? Eagles normally build their nest called iris in tall trees and high cliffs. Powerful. So this speaks to their habitat. Many species lay two eggs, but the older, larger chick frequently kills its younger siblings 
once it has hatched. Not good. The parents take no action to stop the killing. It is said that the eagles fly above the clouds, but this is not true. Oh, so it's not true that they fly above the clouds. Eagles fly during storms and glide. So they fly during storms and glide from wind's pressure. We'll talk about the grace, the grace of gliding. We'll talk about vision. We'll talk about habitat. We'll talk about grace, gliding. Uh, the grace of gliding. This saves the bird's energy. Due to the size and power of many eagle species, they are ranked as the top of the food chain as apex predators in the avian world. The type of prey varies by genus. The bald eagle is noted for having flown with the heaviest load lifted by to be carried by any flying bird. Since one eagle flew with 6.8 kgs mule deer fawn. However, a few eagles may... Come on now. And now coming back to the key text that we're going to use to unlock the power that is embedded in here. The power of flight and of breaking free from gravity. We have at the center stage the eagle. And I would like to break this down into maybe two or five parts. Or just three keys or four real keys that the eagle has to offer it. And the first thing is the vision. So the first thing is vision. Second, habitat. And third, we are going to talk about grace of gliding. And lastly, we're going to talk about renewal. Okay. Or let's call it ego's renewal process. All right, let's start with vision. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. One of the qualities that we need if we are going to be successful and if we are going to really be overcomers and if we are going to break free from the past is to have vision. Now, vision is an interesting term because vision is not just the ability to see what's in front of you. Vision is the ability to see what is not yet here in terms of future, right? And so by definition, the future demands our waiting. By definition, the future cannot happen right now, meaning the future is something that has to be expected and anticipated. And in an inevitable fashion, it requires waiting. So whether we like it or not, we have to wait. We have to wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow cannot be today. So just by the way we are designed and the way the world is, waiting is a thing. So we have to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. One thing we can learn from the ego is it has tremendous vision. That it is able to see things from a distance. And so the first key then to faster flight is to have vision. Is to craft a vision of where you are going. To say, okay, this is what I want and this is where I want to be. Have a vision. Have something that you are aiming at. For the ego, it's the prey. The reason why it's able to fly and do all those maneuvers is because it has a target. It has a goal. And the goal is to catch something, to get some food. So as an entrepreneur, what is your target? What is your goal? Because what's interesting is as the way we are built as creatures of habit is that we are motivated by goals. We are motivated by hope, by something that happens tomorrow. And so waiting is, is an intrinsic human reality. We are built to wait. And there's a power in waiting that we'll talk about in a moment. But first of all, we learn from the ego is to have a vision. So craft a vision. Yes, a lot of things have happened in the past. You come from a poor family. You come from an abusive family, dysfunctional family. All that has happened in the past. And all that is real and true in Asia. But you need to craft a vision of where do I want to be? Or where would I rather be? When you do that is the first step towards faster flight. It's the first step 
towards breaking free from inertia, breaking free from the gravity that holds you down. Craft a vision. Have a vision. Now, the second thing I wanted to highlight was habitat. We learned that egos, they like to habitate or dwell on high cliffs and high altitudes. So habitat is really important. Habitat refers to where you stay, where you live, where you dwell mostly. What do you spend your time, your mind especially, because we're not really here just referring to the physical habitat of the location or the geography, but we're speaking in more psychological terms, let's say. Yeah, we are speaking in more psychological terms. Where are you, for the most part, in your thoughts? Because where you are in your mind really determines how far you can go or how far you can fly. It is true that the place you are can hugely affect who you become. In fact, there's an adage, there's a saying that we are the product of our environments. And I find that to be extremely true. Yes, we are the product of our environments and where we've been and where we grew up and the culture around it. And so you really need to think deep into where you are, like even at a physical level, like where do you live and what sorts of influences have you allowed in your life? What, what sorts of people do you allow to, to walk around you and to be around you? What we can learn from the ego is that we need to habitate or dwell in higher places. So now what that translates to is we need then to find high quality places. So the house you live in, the just that location has to be high quality. It, it has to be something that is inviting to you, right? It has to be something uh, that you want to go to. There's a problem if your workplace is better than your home, right? Because that's really reversed. So make sure your home is high quality. Make up your bed. Make sure everything is nice and neat. But then also, you need to find high quality people. Because habitat refers to places, but also by definition, it refers to people in those places. And so find high quality because it is true that you're the product of the environment. But if you narrow it down, really, you are the product of the people around you because the environment in itself does not have sufficient strength to mold you as the people around you does. And so check the people, especially the people that are most closest to you, you need to have a quality check to say, are these people helping me grow or are they taking away all my energy or are they abusing me and misusing me and taking me for granted? It's a decision you have to make like the ego. If you want to break free from gravity, from the inertia that has been keeping you for the last two, five, 10 years of your life, you want to break free? check your network because as they say your network is your net worth it likes to stay there because the ego knows that in order for you to have faster flight in order for you to have uh, a acute vision and powerful sight in order for you to have powerful flight you need powerful sight back to vision so what's interesting about vision is that for you to have faster flight, you need sharper sight. Anyways, we'll leave at that. So habitat, just to summarize habitat, habitat means make sure your environment is high quality. It's good. And make sure you have the right people around you as well because they affect. So the ego is, is really adapted in many ways in, in how it flies and the feathers and all that. But there's an interesting thing that really makes the ego stand apart. And this is 
really, if you think about it, not the ego's doing in many sense, in some sense, and yet it gives the ego tremendous advantage. In fact, this section is not just called gliding or the grace of gliding. I think we can call it leverage, the power of leverage. The reason why I had coined it the grace of gliding is because I realized that so when the ego is flying, there's this thing where it likes to fly with the current, the updraft. So what happens is that when the sun's rays hit the surface, that heat is reflected back. Some of that is radiated back into the atmosphere, causing updrafts of currents. And so the ego adapts itself to fly with those currents, which preserve so much of its energy. And in doing so, it's able to, to afford some amazing flights that perhaps it could not have otherwise. And that's why I call this grace. I call it grace because it's not the ego's doing that it's able to fly with their currents. But then I also call it leverage because the ego is not sitting in its nest. So that's the funny thing about grace is that grace is granted free for all. And yet if it's not appropriated or leveraged, so to speak, then it is of no use. So here's the question then. Let's be real. Yes, it's been tough for the last one year, two years, five years, ten years. Yes, you're struggling with inertia, being stuck in the same place you've been for the last many years. But did you know that God has grace for you? The Bible says that my grace is sufficient for you. The Bible says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says through his divine power, he has given us everything for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who made us. So yes, there is grace for you. But you will not leverage it if you don't know about it. If you're just sitting in your nest, so to speak, you have to fly out. You have to know where these currents are. I'm starting to get a little bit spiritual here. Getting a little bit biblical here. There's a current, a powerful current. This one is not a wind current. It's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And that, my friend, is the grace, is the ultimate leverage that we have. Jesus became human so he can identify with us, so that he can lift us from our trauma, from our past, from our mistakes, from our pain and suffering, so that we can break free from the gravity that holds us down. Jesus, I did a sermon recently, The Necessity of the Humanity of Jesus. I encourage you to watch it. It's a powerful illustration of why Jesus became human and the advantages that offers to us as humans. Because now we have grace and we can glide like the ego because of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. He has given us that tremendous leverage and ability to be able to, to be able to once again, Reflect the image of God. Yes, we are made in God's image. We lost that image and Jesus comes back in to restore that image back to us, to give us that faster flight and to give us that sharper sight and to give us that ability to break free from all trauma and all trials. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. What does that mean? It means, my friends, that we have to wait. And I'm going to explain in the few moments we have what it means to wait. So I was reading online something about the ego. I watched a documentary about it just to learn more about the ego because it's an interesting bird. And one of the things that came up is that the ego has a lifespan of about 70 years. I did not confirm whether that's bird years or actual human years. But let's take it as it is. 70 years. That's a lifespan. 
that's true of even human lifespans. It's not that all humans reach the lifespan of humans, right? But it said that at age 40, the ego has to make a decision. Life begins at 40, right? <laughs> the ego has to make a decision. By this time, the ego is really worn out. It's done a lot of hunting, a lot of flights. It's really, for lack of a better term, it's exhausted by life. So it has to make a decision. Either it's going to die or it's going to renew itself and live. So most egos choose to die at age 40. But there are egos that choose to live, choose to renew, choose to wait. Actually, that's really the contrast. Either you die or you wait. And it's funny that given those two options, most of us would choose to die rather than to wait. Because waiting is deeper than dying. Waiting involves dying too. But the difference between dying and waiting is that the death of waiting has life at the end. So the ego has to choose to die or to wait for what? Wait for renewal. Wait for strength. Wait for life from somewhere else outside of itself. So what does it do? So the article went on to explain that the ego has to fly to the highest mountain that he can find. And then what it starts doing is it starts to beat its beak on the rock to take out the beak, the old beaten and battered beak. The bold, beaten and battered beak. It has to remove it because it's too old. It, it has to shed it, so to speak. And then it has to shed its feathers. The process takes about 50 or 40 days. And then after all that is done, the ego waits. It does not move. It waits for the days to pass. And it is in the waiting mm, that the renewal happens. It is in the waiting that the strength is given. Because after this renewal process, we are told the ego lives for 30 more years and reaches 70 they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. And of course, after the experience, the ego is able to mount up faster than ever, faster than it has ever flied before, bolder than it was before, because it has renewed its strength. Majority of us would rather die than wait. But I challenge you to wait. What's powerful about waiting is that waiting is not idle. The waiting God is requiring from you and me is active. Active what? Active death. Death is inevitable. We'll decide whether death is going to be passive death where we just die or active death where we choose to die to live. Where we say, I'm going to die to my past and we shed our past like the ego sheds its feathers. We break our beak and tame our tongue like the ego does. We become disciplined, tame our, our desires that leads to destruction. We have to choose to die, to shed our past, to face our traumas, to reconcile with ourselves. That, my friends, is how we renew our strength. And yes, there's a period of waiting. There's a period of uncertainty, of not knowing, but it's active. It's active. When you take a seed and you throw it into the ground, it is in a period of waiting. Yes, from the visible eyes and from the physical manifestations of things, as we see them, we cannot see that anything is going on. And yet, it is in that period of waiting. The seed waits in the soil. The seed dies and bursts, and then it renews its strength. Nor be weary, they shall walk and not faint. See, fellow creators, the greatest creator of all time is ready 
to offer you that strength, that renewal. Will you receive it? Will you wait on the Lord? Challenge for this video is, after this video is down, write down your inertia. What is it that's keeping you down? And then face it and choose to actively die to those things. Choose to actively fly. Make sure you have a vision, just like the ego does. Your vision is necessary because there is no flight without sight. You need to know where you're going before you can take off. And then the other thing you need is your habitat. You need to make sure you're in the right atmosphere, the right place for you to actually fly. You need to make sure you're in the right space for you to fly. And then, of course, you need to wait. You need to be ready to die to yourself, to die to your desires for something better, for more life, for greater joy. Last verse as we close. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is now sat at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus endured the pain, the death, the suffering because of the joy that was set before him. Jesus had a vision. What is your vision? Let me know in the comments what you learned from this video and what you like from the next video. See you for another masterclass next week. Hey again, thank you for watching that video. I hope you learned a lot and I hope that you're now able to leverage and to take flight and fly. And one of the ways that I want to help you do that is by giving you an opportunity to fly with me. So I'm launching a challenge. It's called Create Like God Challenge. It's a challenge that challenges you to create something bigger than yourself, to create something that will outlive you and to create something purposeful and impactful to really break free from whatever it is that's holding you. And so if you're interested in creating a project, creating a podcast, creating a YouTube channel, creating a business or any type of creative enterprise that you like to create, I invite you to join the challenge. You'll be launching soon and I hope that you will be part of those who choose to fly with God.